So good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all here. Thank you for joining uh, this evening. Um, I am uh, Mayor Nagaz, for those of you who don't know me, and I proudly serve as the Executive Director of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. As you all know, we uh, we call ourselves ISPU for short. Um, we really appreciate your interest in our work broadly, as well as just your interest in this fireside chat tonight. I personally really enjoy these um, informal sessions that we've been doing for about a year that just allow us to peel back the curtain a little bit for a behind the scenes look at our projects, our work, our organization, our colleagues in the field, um, and, and the people who really inhabit the, the space in which we work. So we're gonna start tonight by just, um, I'm gonna pick the brains a little bit of our expert panelists, but then we're gonna really open it up for questions and discussions, because we do wanna hear from all of you. I know there are some expert scholars that I see who have joined us, and we'd love to hear your perspectives once we open it up for questions and comments, um, and for everybody just to hear your questions and thoughts as well. Um, this is really meant to be informal, so I am, for those of you who didn't uh, are just joining, I will slowly and methodically be, be um, promoting you to panelists if you choose to do that. That allows us to see you and for you to sort of way, you know, uh, unmute when we get to the conversation section and ask a question. But if you prefer to stay behind the scenes and want to ask a question, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You should uh, hopefully see an option to have a Q&A box. Um, I am recording this just so we can share with people who have registered. And please keep yourselves on mute unless you are asking a question once we open it up. If you feel like doing it, we'd love to hear um, why you joined us tonight and where you're calling in from and who you are. If you want to put that in the chat, that would be great. So before we get started, I just want to provide a little bit of context about what we're talking about tonight. I think most or all of you who are joining us tonight uh, know what ISPU's mission is, but just as a refresher, we are a research and education organization, and we focus on topics impacting upon Muslims in America so that everyone can have better informed conversations and make well-informed decisions. And one of the ways in which we work towards this mission is by conducting regular nationally representative surveys of Muslims alongside Americans of other or no faith. And while each survey that we do and that, that anyone else does is unique and vital, we are certainly by no means alone in this pursuit of knowledge and facts. And so we're really grateful to have our colleague from Pew as well here tonight. Um, so to, you know, we are joined by two expert researchers, um, both of whom spend their days and their considerable talents doing survey research on Muslim populations and experiences. So I'm joined by my very own colleague, Dahlia Mugahed, who is ISPU's Director of Research, and she previously worked at Gallup, so she's been doing this for a very long time. And Bashir Mohammed, a fantastic colleague in our space, who's a senior researcher at the Pew Research Center. I do want to note that we were supposed to be joined by Sarah Shaw from the Muslims in Canada Data Initiative. Unfortunately, COVID is still real <laughs> and still infecting people. And um, she was really sadly unable to join us tonight because she, she came down with it. So welcome, Dahlia and Bashir. We're really happy to see you both. Thank you for having us. So let's get right to it. I am going to start with you, Dahlia. Um, you, as I mentioned before, have been doing research on Muslims and Muslim experiences and populations for nearly two, two decades now, first at Gallup and now at ISPU. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think this type of research is important and also maybe how you've seen the field evolve over the time you've been doing this? Thank you so much. And, and thank you to everyone who's taken time to be with us for this important conversation. And I, I wanna especially welcome um, some of the scholars that have joined us um, as well as Bashir. So um, I have been doing this work since uh, about 2007. And uh, Dr. Esposito, I think, is is actually on with us today. And of course, we joined forces and and wrote "Who Speaks for Islam: What a Billion Muslims Really Think," based on Gallup's research. And 
And, um, and it, I've never looked back. I've continued to work on Muslim research ever since and, and do focus on survey research. So why is this work so important? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize. I could talk about it for an hour. I don't think we want that. But I'm going to summarize by by offering two images to kind of encapsulate what we are trying to do. One is a microphone that we are passing, and the other is a mirror that we are lifting up. So the microphone we are passing is that rigorous representative research gives people a voice. And we are passing the mic to people who don't have access to decision makers, to the halls of power, to the airwaves. And they're often discussed, but seldom heard from. And what rigorous research does is it gives ordinary people a voice. And we are able to take their issues, their challenges, their opportunities, their opinions, and their experiences in a way that is hard to ignore and dismiss because it's rigorous research to those who can make a positive difference, to influencers, to those who start conversations, and to those who make decisions. And it helps to uh, to help, the, you know, for the public at large to better understand their Muslim neighbors. So that passing of the mic is something that I find like a, a sacred duty as a part of research. I, I think it's it's how we, it's a part of being a really truly a servant um, leader of the community is, is to do this kind of work. And when you are studying a, a misrepresented, underrepresented, often demonized community, your, your rigor has to be 10 times more than anyone else's because you're going to be challenged. So it keeps us really focused on excellence. The second piece though is the mirror, the mirror that we're lifting up because it's not just everyone around Muslim communities that needs to understand what Muslims need. It's Muslims themselves and their, their own leadership. And we, we always take for granted that we already know, we already know what we need or we already know what we're thinking. And we don't at all. I am I who have been doing this work you know, for almost two decades, not quite two decades, I'm always surprised by something in every study I've done. So we don't, we, we might assume we know, but there's a lot of things that we don't know because we know the people we know around us. And we, we, we believe that, that they represent everybody and they don't. It's a very diverse community. And unless we do rigorous research, for the community, by the community, um, in in the in the ways that the community cares about, in the way that is relevant and responsive to the community, we're not going to know if we're making progress or if we're going backwards. We're also not going to know what we should be focused on, where our resources should go, where our programming should be uh, focused on, where we need education, where we need investment, and so good rigorous research helps the community know where they are it's it's lifting up a mirror but it's also it's also a gps to move forward i love that um i have a lot of follow up questions as i'm sure our audience does so please uh for those of you listening put any questions that you have in the chat uh sorry in the q and a cuz we'll get to you fairly soon um, Bashir, you know, one of the questions that I know we get asked at ISPU, and I'm sure you get asked this too all the time in your role at Pew, is how many Muslims are there in the United States? Um, if I if I had a dollar for every time I had been asked this over the nine years I've been at ISPU, I would be a fairly rich woman. Um, so I know that Pew has one of the the few estimates that a lot of people point to on the population size of Muslims in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of came to that estimate and talk about the challenges in getting to a definitive number? Sure. Um, th thank you. I think, I think you're right. That's a, that's a question that, um, that, that, that we get often and that um, I think a lot of folks are rightly uh, concerned about. You know, we want to get that right. We want to have a 
good idea of how many Muslims are there. Um, and um, I think there are a few reasons why it's difficult. Um, one is, is related to the point that Dahlia was making, which is that um, we only know the people around us. Um, a sort of corollary to that is Muslims live where other Muslims live. Um, and so there are parts of the country where Muslims are quite sort of make a significant, make up a large share of the, of the population. Um, and most of the Muslims live in those places. And so they look around and they say, you know, there are lots of Muslims around here. So there must be lots of Muslims in the whole country. And that's just not true. There are places in the country where there are very few Muslims. Um, there are, uh, there are states where there's like maybe one mosque for the whole state uh, or two mosques for the whole state. Uh, and so while you might, you know, I, I live in, in the DC area, I previously lived in New York, I previously lived in Chicago. These are all places with large Muslim populations. If I look around there and I see how many Muslims there are, I'm gonna get a sense of like, well, if I project that out to the 300 plus million people in the country, I would assume a pretty large number of Muslims. But, um, but going back to that rigor point that Dahlia says, the sort of rigorous data suggests that that's just not true because Muslims tend to cluster in these places. Um, and so the way that Pew approaches this problem or this question is, is in two directions. Um, and fortunately, both directions land in, in the same ballpark, which gives us a little bit of confidence. Um, one is we conduct surveys of the entire population in the United States. Uh, and we ask people a whole series of questions, including their religious affiliation. And then we see, well, what share of the people tell us that they're Muslim? And then you say, okay, well, if, and it's, and it's a little bit over 1% of, of adults in the United States that when we do these surveys, tell us that they're Muslim. I say, okay, well, you know, if it's a little over 1% of the population and the population's a bit over 300 million, then that means the Muslim population is gonna be somewhere in that three to 4 million range. Um, and so that's one sort of simple way that we do it. Just sort of look at, well, we do a survey of the entire public. We ask religious affiliation, the share in the survey should represent the share in the public overall. Um, the other way that we do it, which is um, more complicated uh, and gives a bit more precision, but a similar range is we'll look at um, not the religious affiliation of the population overall, but the religious affiliation of people within specific racial and ethnic groups. So what share of um, Iranians in the United States are Muslim? And then we can look at the Census Bureau to see how many Iranians there are in the United States. What share of uh, black Americans in the United States are Muslim? And then we can look at the census to see you know, how many black Americans there are. Uh, and so that, that's another way that we can look at it where we can break it into subgroups and say, you know, we know the size of these subgroups based on um, the, the data from the Census Bureau, but what we don't know from that is what share of them are Muslim or, or what share are Christian or what share are, are Jewish um, because uh, the Census Bureau in the United States just doesn't ask religious affiliation. Uh, it asks a lot of questions about age and race and, and immigrant status, but it just doesn't ask affiliation. And so you need these other sources to find that information out. Well, we're really grateful that you do that because that is the number that we always point to when we get asked this, que this question. So um, Dahlia, I'm gonna come back to you, but then Bashir, please feel free to, to, to comment on this question as well. Um, you know, this type of research is not without challenges um, as we've seen. Can you talk a little bit about what those challenges look like? And um, yeah, just what our what ISP's experience has been in in doing this kind of survey research. So thank you so much uh, for <laughs> for the hard question, right? <laughs> so challenges that come with uh, survey research in general, but but especially among Muslims, is that Muslims are, as as Bashir just said, around one percent of the population. So when you're trying to find a, you know, a needle in a haystack, essentially, uh, it's very, very difficult. You're, you're trying to survey a community that is a tiny percentage of the overall population of the country you live in. So just doing a representative survey is, is hard. It's very expensive. 
and um, and it's you know riddled with challenges for those reasons. The second challenge is, as we just heard, well, of course we don't uh, we don't ask about religion in the census, so you don't really know where with with any definite you know definitive data where Muslims live. If we had census data, we could go into like right down to the neighborhood and and find Muslims that way, and it would actually be a lot easier than the methods that we have to use to do a representative uh, survey of Muslims. I think the third thing that makes it challenging is um, folks sometimes, you know, have different ideas of, of what they think this, this research should be doing. We think it should be passing the mic and, and lifting the mirror. And sometimes the mirror isn't going to be gorgeous. You know, we don't all wake up gorgeous. Sometimes we wake up and we look tired. Muslims sometimes look tired in the data. And so it's not a PR job. It, it is not always flattering what we find in our research, but we have to, we have to report as we, you know, as we find the research to be. And I think that that can sometimes be a challenge for folks that already feel so attacked and um, you know misrepresented and negatively portrayed to kind of deal with that and digest that. Uh, so the way we get around that is we ask everybody the same question, right? We have we have uh, as you mentioned, we ask Muslims, Jews and the general public all exactly the same question across our surveys so that when Muslims look tired, guess what? Jews and Christians and non-affiliated people are usually just as tired. So if we're asking about something as sensitive as domestic violence, we're not just asking Muslims, we're asking across the board and guess what? It's about the same. It's actually exactly the same across the board. And, and so we're able to you know, lift up the mirror without making that mirror um, actually embolden or or put a you know weapon be be weaponized by folks who are uh, trying to further demonize our community. So I think that that challenge of how do you do honest work without emboldening your your enemies because you're not always going to find awesome things uh, is is kind of rectified by asking everyone the same question, which is what we try to always do. Bashir, any additional challenges that you would want to note? I'm sure you run into the same kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, I think I I, I don't know that there's there's any additional ones that I would note. I, I think that we run into a lot of the same issues because it's just the nature of the work. You know, the fact that it's really expensive to do this kind of work in a rigorous way, um, especially if you're talking about surveys. Uh, sometimes you can, uh, there are some questions that you can answer without using surveys, you can use focus groups, you can use other sorts of tools, but when you're trying to do a sort of national survey, um, it's gonna be expensive, it's gonna be complicated, it's gonna require a lot of work in terms of figuring out how to do, how to do it, where to do it, um, in order to make sure that it's representative, right? You know, the easy thing would be, okay, let's go send a mailing to all the mosques and ask the mosque leaders or the people in the mosque, well, what do you think? Um, and, you know, you get the views of lots of Muslims, but those would be the Muslims that are associated with the mosque. Mm -hmm. um, and what the nationally representative data tells us is that's not all the Muslims. Oh. Sorry, can everyone mute? Um, please, thanks. It's mine. Oh. <laughs> Dahlia. <laughs> I, I, I'm so sorry, but now we have okay. <laughs> Um, Sorry, Bashir, did you want, was there a... No, I was, I was just, I was just saying that, you know, we know, we know that, um, that there are shortcuts that you can take, but the shortcuts um, often compromise the, the quality of the data. You know, if you just go to mosques and ask people, you know, what do you think about you know, mosque, how important are mosques to you? Well, you know, you're associated with a mosque, so clearly you think they're at least a little bit of important. Or if you just ask people who have Muslim sounding names, well, what about all the folks who are, who are converts? What about, you know, black Americans who, you know, there's a whole host of folks who don't have Muslim sounding names or stereotypically Muslim names, and you'd sort of systematically miss them. And so doing it well, doing it right is, is difficult. 
Um, and, I, and, I, and we also do run into a lot of the same issues um, that Dolly talked about in terms of um, the balance between being sort of as honest with the data, being honest with the data, even when it's not flattering um, and providing enough context that it doesn't, uh, that it can be properly understood. Uh, because there's, there's definitely the potential to say, you know, oh, look, if we just ask Muslims this question, look at what, what Muslims think about this, and oh, isn't this interesting? And it's like, well, you know, sometimes you can say, sometimes there, are, it's important to not just answer the question, because you do want to know, like, in the Muslim population, what's going on? Is this an issue? Is that an issue? Um, but also have enough context that you can say, and here's how that compares. Um, or here's how we can make sense of that. Um, or here's sort of a, another aspect of it that isn't part of this question, but it's part of this other question. Um, so finding ways to provide enough context so that um, the findings, whether they're flattering or not, can be understood um, sort of in their fullness. Great. And just a reminder to everyone that we will open it up for questions. I'll probably throw one or two more questions out. So think about, uh, I know I see some questions coming in, keep them coming. Um, in the Q&A, I do see some in the chat too. Um, just one thing to add to, to what Bashir and Dahlia said, another challenge that I, I guess I've noticed just uh, from my vantage point watching um, you know, us do these surveys is that I think people don't necessarily always understand what you can and can't accomplish through a nationally representative survey. So they want a lot of answers to questions because you, you, you'll you get a great data point that like really gets you thinking. And then the first human instinct is to say, well, why? <laughs> why is that the case? And you can't necessarily answer that question always from the data that you've gathered, right? There's only so much it can do. And then you need other methodologies to like get to drill down and look at those points a little bit further. So I think, I guess that that's one thing I would love for people to understand is like, there's only so much that this type of data um, or research can tell you. And then you have to look to other ways to get that information. Um, so thinking about the future, you know, Pew does these surveys uh, every, you know, fairly regularly and in, in sort of a I don't know, every five to seven year cadence, Bashir. ISVU has been doing them every year. We went to every two years. Now we'll probably take a little bit more of a, a lag time for the next one. Um, so there are surveys out there, but time marches on. <laughs> so what do you both, I'm just gonna throw this out to both of you and whoever wants to answer first and then add. You know, what do you see as the gaps in our current knowledge and what opportunities are there for future exploration? Where do we go from here? Bashir, I'll start with you this time, just to, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I think that, um, I guess there's sort of two, two ways that I think about this. Um, you know, one is uh, sort of demographically, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to the point where most surveys uh, like the, of the type we're talking about focus on adults, people who are at least age 18. Um, and there's sort of a new generation of folks that are sort of growing and becoming a critical mass who um, don't see 9-11 as the before and after. Like, every, like all, everyone, all the panelists, most of the folks on this call, you know, have memories of before 9-11 and then memories of after 9-11 and like are, have been impacted in various ways and think about the ways in which society and their lives changed. Um, and we're reaching the point where, where there's a, a growing uh, share of adults that were born after that. Um, you know, 2001 was 22 years ago at this point. And so, you know, if you're 22, you, you know, you were born after that. There is no before. You know, if you were 25, you're, you're still, you know, you were two years old before. You know, so, so there's, there's this, this sort of group of folks that um, have started to uh, mature and age into our surveys um, that just have a very different perspective of the world that isn't colored by this shift that, that, that for many people was this sort of, you know, watershed 
uh, marker for many Muslim Americans, which is sort of watershed, and there's a sort of before and after in a whole host of ways. Um, so I think that's one one thing that that new research um, can can shed light on is the ways in which that um, population, those folks, are are different. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, from my daughter, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a variety of ways, but having sort of survey data that really looks at that in a systematic way. Um, the other um, isn't, isn't demographic. I think it's, it's slightly related, but is more substantive, is the fact that um, there is a, a growing population within the Muslim American community um, that sees Islam as more of a culture or ethnicity than a religion. Um, that 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 are not particularly tied closely to the theological beliefs and practices, um, but are still like, well, you know, I'm going to still during Ramadan go to my parents' house and you know enjoy the iftar. I'm still going to be at the Eid celebration. Uh, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, I'm still going to give salam if I see a Muslim. Uh, so so there's this this sort of group of Muslims um, that, that I think the survey data up until now hasn't really um, captured uh, and described as, as, as well as I, as I think we could. And that I think that within the Muslim community, especially the more religious parts of the Muslim community, there's not even a recognition that they exist. Mm -hmm. And so it's another one of these places where the survey data, if done properly, can sort of shed light on hey, look, there's this other set of folks who are saying that they're Muslim and it means something different for them than it does for you. Uh, so, so those are two, two, I think, newer, two things that I think new surveys about Muslim Americans can explore. Dahlia, does anything else come to mind for you in terms of um, gaps or future exploration? It's hard. I'm I'm not as future uh, oriented as Bashir, but um, I, I can barely keep track of the present. But the things that I think we should keep doing uh, and expand on are looking at two things. One is how American Muslims feel and and view hot hot button topics that Muslims are are never thought of when we discuss climate change or gun safety or you know abortion maybe abortion i don't know but the things that everyone is debating and we we as you know a community have opinions as and um and are seldom sort of part of those debates we we aren't asked we aren't we aren't part of them we we just our voice isn't there and so to be able to have a way to weigh in on some of these national conversation. So that's one. And then the second thing that I think we need to keep doing and expand on is deeper dives into the needs of Muslim Americans, the challenge facing the challenges facing American Muslims. I remember when I first started this work at least well especially internationally, um it was about asking the question, you know, why do they hate us? So it's kind of us, it's all about us, but also how do we dispel misconceptions? And, and Who Speaks for Islam is a really good, strong response to so many of these misconceptions. And it was just like Muslims speaking for themselves, telling us what they thought about democracy and women's rights and so forth. And those things are so important. But now I feel like that's already out there. We've done that work. Now we need to challenge, we, we need to have a different conversation. Like, the conversation needs to be, here is what everyone else, here's what our government is getting wrong for us. Here's how they're not meeting, you know, the bare minimum um, of our needs as citizens. So the study we just did on banking while Muslim is a really good example of that. Would And it's a study we would have maybe, maybe not like never thought of before, but it wasn't as top of mind. We were too busy sort of telling people who we were and just you know correcting them on that that we didn't have enough time to say and by the way we're not okay with how you're treating us in this way and here's the data to prove that there is this you know a disparity and there is discrimination and what are you going to do about it so i think more and more research needs to be done 
on the needs of American Muslims. So another area of need that we uncovered is like voter suppression. I would have never thought of that, but actually one of our advisors suggested we look at that. And we did, and we were surprised to find that a lot of people experience voter suppression. And, and so I, I just think we need to do a lot more on where are people's challenges and how do we help um, how do we help folks make positive change in their normal everyday lives? Great. Um, I think I'm going to, I can throw out a few more questions later if there's time, but I think um, I'm seeing some questions come in in the Q&A and also in the chat box. So I think I'm going to try to get to some of those now. So um, if people have you know questions, please put them in. I'm going to start, there's actually three questions about data and findings, like specific data and findings. So I'm going to throw those three out first. And please feel free, Dahlia and Bashir, to answer what you can. Um, one question is, um, I think this person is asking, you know, is there any survey research like this or or anything that the survey research that Pew or ISPU has done already? Um, is there anything that it can tell us about LGBTQ Muslims? So that's one sort of data-related question. Another is, um, how have we seen the wider American community's perception of the Muslim community change over time? You know, what has that looked like? Have we tracked that over the past, you know, 10 years or so? And, ha and how has it changed? Is, is there greater polarization or greater harmony? Um, and then somebody else asked about, um, in terms of community measurement, into Bashir's discussion before about tracking populations, um, do you know, for example, the Jewish community, how the Jewish community has measured um, size um, and how that might be different from, from the size of Muslim populations? So I'll stop there. Those are the three data questions. Okay, Bashir, do you want to start or should I? So I, I can I can jump in. We've Pew's done some work on on the Jewish community as well. I've worked on some of our studies on, on American Jews, so I can talk quickly about that. Um, and um, and then I think we have similar data on the the changes in public perception. So you could you could sort of jump in there. Um, so uh, so on the on the Jewish community, the the short answer is it's the same issue. It's a small population. The census doesn't ask it. And so you've got to come to, you've got to do something else. Um, there, the, the, there are, there's something that makes it a little easier and something that makes it a little harder. Um, what makes it a little easier is that the Jewish community is just more mature in the US. They've been here longer. They have more institutions developed. Um, they have more of a research infrastructure developed. Um, you know, they've been doing, um, surveys of Jewish Americans, sort of nationally representative surveys of Jewish Americans for 40 years. Um, and so, and so there's just sort of a built bigger infrastructure. Um, and so that makes it easier in some ways. Um, one thing that makes it harder, um, or more complicated anyway, is that the definition of who's Jewish is contested in some ways. Um, uh, because within the Jewish community, there is a clear recognition that it's um, not just a religious identity, it's also an ethnic identity. Um, so for example, in Pew's studies of, of, of American Jewry, we ask you know, the religious affiliation questions and then among people who say that they're religiously unaffiliated, we ask, aside from religion, do you consider yourself uh, culturally Jewish uh, because of your background or heritage? Uh, and so then the question of like, well, how many Jews are there in the United States? Well, what definition are we using? Are we talking about the religious definition? Are we including these folks who say that they don't have a religion, but they have Jewish parents and they feel culturally, culturally connected or culturally Jewish? Uh, and so the definition is just fuzzier. Um, there's less in the Muslim community of an idea that like, well, you can be religiously unaffiliated and we're still gonna count you as Muslim um, because your parents were Muslim and you say you sort of feel a connection. Um, in the Muslim community, there's just a lot less sort of interest in sort of broadening the definition that way. And so it's just sort of a simpler way to define 
uh, the question. Yeah. Um, let me comment on the uh, changes in public opinion over the past two decades. And we had, uh, so let me start by the, saying this. We at ISPU developed something called an Islamophobia Index. We started measuring it in 2018. And we look at um, five key indicators, and then the average of the five creates the index number. Um, and so what we look at is the degree to which the public endorses five key tropes around, um, you know, just imagine sort of the five key tropes about Muslims, and, and that's what the Islamophobia Index is there for. And we've seen a slight decline in the overall index number from 2018 until now in, in almost every group that we measure, except for one. Um, sadly, that one group that is inching upwards, not downwards, in their endorsement of anti-Muslim tropes are, ready for it, Muslims, Muslims themselves. Internalized Islamophobia is on the rise. So that's one piece of um, bad news, but, but uh, a very important finding, I believe. Now, I also track or, or or I personally as a researcher look at Pew's data because Pew is the only research firm that I'm aware of that has pre 9-11 data on um, the views of the American public on Muslims. And, and then you can actually compare right before 9-11, right after 9-11 and see what happened, right? The, the big like horrific event. And Pew's data shows that there was an actually a slight improvement, believe it or not, in people's views of American Muslims right before 9-11 versus right after. Okay, so that's already kind of challenging some of our ideas, but when you look at it even you know longer term, where it's like 20 years of data, and you look at right after 9-11, all the way until now, basically, or 2000, you know, something during the Trump administration is kind of the, the last time I saw the data was in, I think, 2017. What you find is first, there's a partisan divide in uh, starting in 2008. Before that, they actually, Republicans and Democrats tracked not that far apart. But in November of 2001, okay, so notice that the, the month is November, a third, one third of Republicans believe that Islam uh, in, encourages violence more than other religions. That number was 67% in 2017. So 33 to 67%. So in uh, certain partisan communities in our country, anti-Muslim sentiment is on the rise and it is completely independent, completely has nothing to do with acts of violence carried out by Muslim. Independent, does not track with acts of violence in any way, shape or form. You can look at this data, it's fascinating. It, it gets worse, not around acts of violence, actually. It gets worse around election, election cycles. So you see very clearly in this data how Islamophobia is a tool of public manipulation, and it's a it's a political tool, not an organic kind of response to bad things happening. Um, the other time that that number really spiked is in the run up to the Iraq War, uh, not right after 9-11. So you, you really see that it is in response to political rhetoric and not the um, events that happen on the ground. Now, I want to also respond to the first question about LGBTQ Muslims. We've been asking in the demographic section of our research about people's sexual orientation, orientation I believe since 2018. And we've um, consistently found that around nine to 10% of every faith group, except for white evangelicals, where, the, where it's about 1%. But other than white evangelicals, everyone else, it's, it's nine to 10%. Identify as non-straight. Now it could be gay, lesbian, bisexual, other, but they're not choosing, you know, straight. Um, and that includes Muslims are in the same, uh, you know, kind of conform along that um, that norm or that 
you know, that average that we're finding in the research. Um, white evangelicals are the only group where it's zero to 1% every single time we measure it that are identifying as non-straight. Thank you both so much. Um, Rafath, I'm going to come to you in just one second, but just to comment on the last um, note that Dahlia gave. One thing I, I'd like to note, and Dahlia and Bashir, who are the experts, if I'm saying anything that's wrong, you know, correct me, but drilling down um, into more specific questions about some of the subpopulations. Uh, so whether that's LGBTQ individuals or a couple of other people have asked about, for example, specifically people of Somali background, um, or other, you know, sort of subgroups within Muslim communities. It because this um, research, this nationally representative research, is so expensive, and the numbers, you know, when you cut it in a million ways, the numbers who particularly belong to some of these subgroups are just so small that it's it's impossible to make inferences about, you know lots of questions that you might want to ask. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because I know a lot of questions are coming up in the in the chats and Q&As about very specific subpopulations and, and that can be difficult. Um, Rafath, I, I see you want to ask a question, so go ahead. Yes, please. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of very uh, traumatic, but I will have to let you know. Um, we are dealing with a very solid, horrific situation. My husband and I are still reeling from that, from that experience that we faced by this mosque, which I will tell you later. On the on the day of Eid, Eid al-Fitr, uh, we went to the mosque. Uh, we went to this venue to pray. Uh, we didn't have the registration. Because I'm I'm really sorry. I I I know that you and I um I, I I understand this this story um and I'm very sorry for what happened. I do, given the time and sort of the expertise of the panelists, if if you have a question about survey research, this is a very appropriate time for that. If not, let's you and I. So my so my survey time. my survey question would be okay. What have uh, your organization done uh, with regards to all the mosques um, and uh, this particular mosque who has a Machiavellian, who have adopted a Machiavellian policy. The board runs like a, a boys club. Um, they are very uh, misogynist and patriarchal. And uh, when you ask them some question, make recommendation, they retaliate against you. Uh, this story, if you want, you want, let me tell you, you want no. to even speak on my behalf, but sister, this will go in Ra the newspaper. I'm, I'm very sorry. It's just, I understand um, you and I can connect offline, but that is a good question about um, whether there's been any survey research done on mosque governance. So I'll leave that to the panelists to discuss. Well, actually, I mean, Dr. Hassan Bagbe is on um, on with us, and he he would be he is the sort of the foremost expert on mosque governance um, of really anyone, and it's great that he's here. He has led research on mosque governance and um, how mosques are run, uh, what percentage of the board is women, what are their rules around, you know, the uh, the participation of women. And we were really honored to have gotten to publish the latest results in our mosques in in the mosque study um, that Dr. Hassan, you know, led. And and that is on our website. I encourage you to take a look at that because you'll be able to see, you know, what percentage of mosques have women on the board. What percentage of mosques have, um, you know, partitions or don't in the in the musalla in the area where people pray. And so forth. And then the other thing I, I'd like to make sure that we, you know, make everybody aware of, is another study that I also uh, that we also worked on with Dr. Aksan Bagbi, who who led the Reimagining Muslim Spaces study. And that is rather than um, you know putting numbers to these things, but it's it's actually giving solutions. It's giving recommendations based on people's own 
stories of how to make mosques more inclusive of young people, of women, um, and of people who are embracing Islam, you know, newly convert, new converts. Uh, so those are the, the three people that, or not the three kind of groups that we really focused on for this project. And we have very actionable recommendations and we've done trainings across the country of mosque boards on how to help, you know, how to make their masjid more inclusive of, of, of everyone, of our entire community. There's a couple of questions from researchers themselves about <laughs> just uh, sort of managing their own um, emotional needs within doing this research. So one person asks about, um, they're doing research on Muslim identity development in their doctoral work. And they'd love some tips for getting started, especially with this nagging thought that the focus should be bigger or broader. Another um, Muslim researcher who is also researching Muslim communities calls it a, a type of emotional labor. And how do you sort of manage that? Um, so, so just some tips for researchers themselves. So um, I just dropped into the chat some of the things that Dahlia was talking about, some of those resources, the mosque report and analysis that we did specifically on women, and then that reimagining Muslim spaces report. So if folks want to dig into that data, it's there. Um, but to the, this, the researcher's question, um, I'd say um, oh, two things. Uh, one is that uh, it, it definitely can be, I'll, I'll speak first, you know, for myself, um, it definitely can be um, a uh, emotionally uh, it, and, and, and emotionally draining uh, exercise to do research on a community that you're involved in, that you're um, invested in its success, um, especially when you know the the findings aren't in line with where you wish the community were. Uh, yeah, it, it can be uh, you know uh, it can, it can be difficult. Um, I'll, I'll speak for myself and say that uh, I really do believe in the Pew Research Center's uh, mission and, and, and position, which is that uh, you can't move forward and improve until you know where you are. And so the value of the work that we're doing, the value of work I'm doing, that Dolly's doing, is that it, it helps us see where we are. Um, and then once we see that, we can say, okay, if this is where we are and that's now where we wanna be, then, okay, what's the next step? What can we do to, to improve things? But if you don't even know, like, oh, what do you mean? It seems like it's fine and it's really not. Um, so so that's, that's sort of my sense on that. Um, in terms of the question of whether it needs to be bigger, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, a, it, it's, a, it's really a very sort of specific, I'd, I'd say for dissertation in particular, um, in a certain sense, that's a that's a dissertation committee conversation. <laughs> uh, the the it is the case that um, there are not a lot of, to be perfectly frank, there aren't a lot of jobs um, that are focused on doing research on Muslims. Uh, and so, if that's really all you're doing, um, that may not be you know the strongest career bridge, um, which, you know, that may or may not be the biggest concern for you. I think, you know, there's a lot of other questions that you need to ask yourself, but, um, but there is, there is definitely value um, from that perspective and being broader. I'd also say that um, for a lot of, for, for studying Muslims or really any one group, there's a, there's, there's a risk of over particularizing, um, you know, Dolly alluded to this when she was saying, you know, we asked the same question of everyone. Um, if all you're doing is saying like, here's what Muslims think about this or know about this or do about this, um, you need some other mechanism to sort of make sure that you're not um, declaring a Muslim problem what's really just a general American problem. Um, and so, so, you, so it, you know, you don't always, comparative isn't the only way to do that, but you're gonna need some mechanism to, to sort of pull yourself out of, well, I asked the Muslims and they said, 
X. And so this must be about being Muslim. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just about being American. Um, or maybe it's just about, you know, being black, if you're talking about, you know, black Americans, or maybe it's about, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so you do need some mechanism to, to make sense of that. Great. I'm going to ask one more audience question and then wrap up with one uh, one additional question. Miriam, I know you've been patiently waiting, um, so please, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to um, initially thank you for this wonderful fireside chat um, that you have provided. Um, it's been very helpful, and I do hope that I could one day um, cooperate with the ISBU organization um, to be part of the uh, team and um, empowering um, and enhancing and informing the public about a Muslim situation. So I just don't want to take a lot of your time. I'm wondering if um, um, parallel with the challenges that ISBU um, tries to pinpoint, does it also um, delve into the uh, points of empowerment that Muslims think that they have um, you know, uh, improved in, let's say in the past 20 years or um, after 9-11, as Brother Bashir said, um, about the new generation of Muslims that don't really um, have that image or mentality about, um, you know, what happened before 9-11. Um, so yeah, that's one thing that I wanted to know about. Thank you. Dahlia, I'm gonna shoot that maybe initially over to you. Um... Um, so I, I guess the, the question being, um, around empowerment and we have, a, you know, we have survey research that I think people find a lot of empowerment in, um, and I'll just mention a few things and it actually, it's not always survey research, but, um, you know, there's a number we found in our latest survey in 2022 where we were able to estimate the number of jobs that American Muslims are create in America, how many jobs American Muslims create. And, um, you know, it's over a million jobs and, and that's a very empowering number. And that's a number that you can find through a survey, through a good, a well done survey. So that's, that's one example, but we, we do other types of research like the Muslims for American progress uh, project where it's a quantification of American Muslim contributions in a number of fields. And, and these are, you know, we, we did something, we, we talk about it as the hard facts and the human face. So the hard facts are like, this is how many jobs American, you know, Michigan Muslims create every year, or this is how much they contribute to the economy. And it's like dollars and cents, and it's all backed up with all this research. But we also do, photo narratives alongside that to have to give people a human face who who are American who are Muslims in Michigan and all their diversity and people get to tell their story and they have these beautiful portraits to go along with it. We did a similar study of a group that a lot of people don't know exists Native American and indigenous Muslims. And we were able to do this incredibly empowering inspiring and everyone who has looked at this um, photo exhibit really does find it very empowering uh, where Native American and Indigenous Muslims, um, their voice is amplified and, and we, we kind of lift up their voices, uh, a community that's 1% of the American Muslim community, which is 1% of the population. So a tiny, tiny community that most people don't even know exists and we were able to sort of shine a light and and um, center their voices. So those are some examples. And uh, if, I, if, if I could just quickly um, sort of take it from a, a slightly different angle. Um, some of Pew's, so, you know, in Pew's survey of Muslim Americans, we definitely do ask Muslim Americans if they've experienced discrimination um, and those sorts of things. And we've actually seen um, some increases over the, the, the time that we've been doing the survey in terms of the number of Muslims that have said they've experienced various sorts of discrimination. Um, but we also ask Muslims um, if some express support for them um, because of their religion. Uh, so it's not uh, just asking about the negative, it's also the positive. And we've seen that rising as well. 
Um, so, so that's sort of another way that the, the survey data shows, uh, you know, so a different perspective or, or more complexity is that um, while there's definitely discrimination that's present, there's also um, a, an experience of welcome that, that, that some Muslims sort of talk about and point to. Um, and so there's sort of both pieces of that. And if all you ever talk about is the discrimination, you can lose sight of the fact that like, that's not the only thing that's happening. Great. In the few minutes that we have left, I can't think of a more perfect um, person to, to end with than uh, Dr. Esposito, who has a question. So Dr. Esposito, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll unmute, but I won't show you what I look like right now. <laughs> uh, I'd rather have this phony picture up there. Um, you know, I, I hear today talking about the fact that many Muslims um, or more Muslims uh, are moving towards thinking about culture and ethnicity as an ID rather than religion. And this is not just true for Jews, it's true for Christians, et cetera. You know, it's certainly in a number of, of, of Western countries. Does this say anything about the exposure to uh, American or sort of modern American, depending on your European country, European culture, or perhaps as a constituted challenge to imams? Does it constitute a challenge, um, you know, uh, to Muslim scholars of Islam? I can think about the situation I was in a couple of years ago. It was more than that, but I don't want anybody to be able to figure out where I'm talking about. I'm at a wedding with my wife, uh, and uh, we're the probably the only non-Muslims, and we're sitting with somebody who basically is saying that uh, his... Uh, father, okay, now the grandfather of his children, okay, his father established the mosque, but he probably was going to have to move away from his father's mosque, because his two sons in their mid-20s came home and said, the imam's sermon, sermons and his outlook on the world don't match. And I've seen that in Catholicism, I've seen that in a number of forms of, of Christianity. So I, I think there could also be something here I'm not an expert on, um, uh, you know, the profile of uh, of imams, et cetera, but it's just my experience in a number of religious traditions is that there's a lag time in terms of the way in which, if you will, official religion or officials um, are able having to deal with a significant number of an older generation, but also figure out a way to pull in a newer generation. And it would seem to me that if you're in a country like America or, or, or many countries in Europe today, uh, which Islamophobia is an issue, in addition to the cultural issues, uh, there can be reasons why people segue out. I mean, it's just a question that I would raise. The future consideration, we don't have to do it tonight. <laughs> But I'll be with Dahlia in Doha so we can discuss this at great length. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, I, I think, you know, that what we heard in um, the focus groups we did for when we did reimagining Muslim spaces from a number of people, from, from young people, from young women, from young men, and even from some older folks, is that when they feel when they felt the most alive in a masjid is two is kind of in two instances one when the congregation itself was welcoming that they they kind of felt like family um one woman said that she would go to this one juma and she didn't even speak the language this is so strange the 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 khutbah the the sermon was in turkish and she didn't understand Turkish, but she went because she just loved the people there. So it was that important to her just to be around people she liked that felt friendly and warm than even understanding the sermon. So that was one. And then the second one was relevant sermons, relevant educational programming. That's what made people want to go to a certain, you know, sacred space. And they felt they felt included, they felt seen. So the opposite of that, if, if you're feeling totally alienated by what the imam is saying, um, you know, one can imagine that that would kind of drive people away. 
Um, I, I think Yaqeen did a study on doubt. Now, th these weren't people who had completely like left Islam, but they had experienced great, a, a great deal of doubt. And, uh, and some of those, you know, a, a percentage, a, a significant percentage of the doubters did express, you know, told uh, stories and, and did talk about um, religious authorities or teachers who who would say things that they felt were very alienating. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. Um, ISP is nothing if not on time. So <laughs> given that we've come to the conclusion of this hour, um, I want to thank everyone for, for joining tonight. We will be sending out this recording to everyone who registered. I know there's been a couple of questions about that. Um, I'll also try to include some of the links that we talked about tonight so that you can access them from that email. I want to really thank um, Dahlia and Bashir both, uh, not only for joining tonight, Night and sharing their expertise and wisdom, um, but just for the incredible work that they do every single day. Um, it's really, as someone who witnesses it and gets to, to, to partake in their brilliance, um, I'm just really grateful and, and want to thank them both. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I see so many familiar names and faces and some real giant uh, giants in the research field have joined us tonight, and um, I want to thank thank you all uh, for joining us tonight, for your excellent questions, um, and for your interest in this work. So thank you, every uh, thank you everyone very much, and we will see you at the next fireside chat in a couple of months.